first featured talk is a highly anticipated one. Today we have David Fetterman and Zoltan Ola. And uh, David is the VP of Engineering at Famous and formerly the Mobile Engineering Manager at Facebook. And Zoltan is, uh, is a developer at Percolate Studios who um, brought you the new Atmosphere UI. I, I hope some of you saw that from last Dev Shop. And uh, Famous and Perklet have teamed up to do a Famous Plus Meteor integration. So to tell you more about that, David and Zoltan. Is this thing hooked up? Cool. So I'm Zoltan, and uh, I don't know if you can hear that. Is yes. That, yeah. Uh, I'm a partner and engineer at Percolate Studio, and uh, yeah, we build, uh, we build real-time web apps with uh, amazing clients. And this is uh, Dave Fetterman, hey. uh, VP of Engineering at Famous. You guys build crazy cool JavaScript accelerated UI. Frankly. How many of you guys have heard of Famous? <clears throat> How many of you guys have heard of Meteor? <laughs> oh man, we've got some catching up to do. How many of you guys have heard of Facebook Paper? Have you seen the new Facebook paper application? Why is that significant? Well, the paper app's beautiful, right? It's like a flipboard style interaction that's just absolutely gorgeous. And when you look at it, it's pretty cool. It's composed of a small number of interactions that actually compose into something more, uh, a lot more interesting. So you have your typical elements of something like a scroll view, which you can find in anything from your basic you know, Twitter table view controller style application up to the very most sophisticated. You have a lot of interesting transitions here where let's say you are what, pulling into view of more of a detail view. You, you, can, you can watch the photo sort of expand, the text sort of opacitates in and out. And then of course you can apply scroll view in a vertical way as well. Um, and something even that people don't expect, but unless you work at Flipboard, um, this kind of interaction here. We are actually digging into something uh, by this really cool semi-3D uh, positioning of tiles in space. Now, these things are impressive because people didn't even think until recently that you could really pull this off, even in something as sophisticated as UIKit or Quartz Core on the iOS side in the UI framework. Um, but really, when you look at this kind of stuff, the GPU eats these kind of interactions up. The GPU essentially deals with something called surfaces. I'm sorry, it deals with something called textures, which are essentially 2D surfaces that it moves and manipulates in space, and it's really, really good at it. Um, when you program in iOS, you're basically all the way at the bottom, you end up you know, dealing with surfaces that are moved and manipulated very quickly in the GPU. And when you do this in web as well, you're, you end up in the same spot. The trick is that for the most part, People haven't written a UI development framework that takes advantage of talking right to the GPU to deliver this kind of thing. So Facebook Paper is this gorgeous application written entirely in Quartz Core and iOS. But Famebook, as you see here, is essentially the same thing written entirely in web technology. So you guys are obviously into web technology. If you're looking for a way to make your jobs as application and site developers a lot easier by using a, fr a framework like Meteor, a next generation uh, system that solves a lot of the problems that are kind of just like thorny and always come up when you're trying to build something sophisticated. And that's true definitely on the back end for Meteor. And Famous does a lot of the same things, but on the front end. So something that once was only achievable in Quartz Core or really in like deep native technology is achievable actually in JavaScript and web technology. Now why this is so surprising, Zoltan's gonna show you right now. Thank you, so allow me to Transfer this across. All right, so Mosaic, 1993. Uh, that's when it came out. That's when the web arguably started. But uh, since 1993, it's grown up. And it's evolved from being just a purely document delivery platform to being like a feature-rich application platform. And that's no small feat, but there's a problem. And that problem is that DOM, is, DOM layout is really slow. And HTML, CSS has gotten so complex over the years that you can render just about anything you want, but it takes the browsers uh, quite a lot of work to actually figure out how to lay that out using the DOM. And there's also no performant way uh, to animate in JavaScript, uh, so you have to use CSS. 
And CSS3 is, is great for doing animations, but it's pretty limited and, uh, and also the performance is, can be sketchy. It's unpredictable. <clears throat> so Famous sidesteps the DOM layout altogether and renders to the GPU directly. Uh, and to do so performantly, the entire Famous scene is built in JavaScript. And that also means that uh, you can use JavaScript to um, control way more complicated layouts dynamically based on where things are uh, than you could in HTML. And <clears throat> Meteor, I mean, of course, we all love Meteor. It's a great real-time platform uh, for building like trivially easy, for, for building really complex apps and deploying them in a trivially easy way. And you get a really rich ecosystem, you get live data, you get reactivity, auth, routing, package management, all of that like, good stuff that we, we want to use. And thanks to its declarative syntax, it's really quick and easy to write Meteor apps. And because you're writing such few lines of code, and I've, I find this in my uh, development, daily development, I, I seem to end up with like, much fewer bugs. Uh, so let's get these two frameworks working together. And it turns out it's actually really easy to, to do, and they complement each other really well. Right, so Meteor is a very principled framework, right? You, you, you do things right. And when you do things right, you get things simple, and you get things very performant. Famous has a number of principles as well. In order to build that JavaScript-based application on, you know, that actually feels like a 60 frame per second application, and you could actually deploy to something like an App Store, you have to follow a number of principles. And we'll talk about these a little throughout the lecture, but first of all, you want to treat your application like an app. Don't cram a document into it and pretend that the layout of the browser is going to give you Facebook paper. It's just not going to happen. Second, talk right to the GPU. When you're actually able to manipulate those textures in the GPU in a performant way, sidestepping browser layout, you're going to be able to get that juicy feel, that real, that, that real 60 frame per second on whatever device you're working on. Uh, third, uh, you want to use physics and natural motion to actually compose these things. If you build just something that's really fast, but like it flies around and feels like, like it's out of control, it's not going to be enjoyable anyway. So janky and like stuttering is one thing, but something that doesn't feel natural. It doesn't feel like you could actually, when you touch it, it responds to you. That's going to be a problem. So you want to use physics for natural motion. And finally, um, get it ready for WebGL. Because this is going to be, you know, when we're talking about this maybe a year from now, WebGL is going to be available on, on all the devices you use now, and people will be talking about how do I build something in 3D instead of just with DOM. So anyway, we'll go into some of the, the deep notions, or the, the, I guess the core notions, of what it means to build in Famous, and uh, that's one reason why we brought Zoltan on uh, in our private beta, to see how these things work together. So the scene graph is, is really important. That's what you're going to be using to, to lay out your, your Famous apps and to build the UI. Um, so we've got maybe an example app here. And <clears throat> that's composed of surfaces, right? Famous surfaces. And so the header there might be a surface. Uh, this bottom section might be a surface. And, and in fact, the background might just be a background image, but it could be a surface as well. And this is in contrast to what you're going to see when you build traditional web applications, where you're basically inserting DOM, which represents at, at once a hierarchy, the content, as well as the structure that the browser is going to try to interpret as a document, lay it out its own way, and jankify your whole experience. So surfaces mapping directly to GPU textures and managed pristinely by uh, a very principled architecture, that's how you're going to get that performance. But surfaces are just divs at the end of the day. So you throw your own HTML content into surfaces. You make it seem so like simple. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, what can I say? I, I think it is. I think everyone's going to find it pretty simple and, and lovely, really. So the other, the other thing that's, uh, that's important to understand is transforms. So transforms act on surfaces to position them in the scene graph. <clears throat> yeah, and so a surface, when we're looking at this paper example, all these pieces of HTML content that move atomically, where you don't break the pieces apart, that's a surface. That goes right to the GPU, and the GPU says, OK, I got this, and then it moves it around. The transform is what, tell, is what the GPU uses, it's essentially a, a matrix, to say where I'm going to position on the screen, scale, skew, rotate, and even opacitate. 
So when you combine all those things, those are the atoms that actually build up into the, into the giant super molecule that is your application. So at the very end of the day, a performant application is simply built off of the surfaces, the displayed pieces of GPU content, and the transforms that move them around. And transitions allow transforms to act as animations too. So let's see some code. <clears throat> Should I pretend like I'm coding with you? Yeah, you might awesome. as well. If you see any mistakes, just let me know. Not that there will be, so. <laughs> because it's so simple. So here we have, uh, on the right, we have a surface. And on the left is the code that generates that surface. And this is a Meteor project. And it has the famous package added. But apart from that, it's just a vanilla Meteor project. And so you can see. This is all I've had to do to render a surface to the page. So next up, we're going to do something a little bit more complicated. So we, ha we take that surface, and we're going to uh, set some transforms and set an easing curve transition. And when we click the surface, we're simply going to apply that transition. So as you can see, we've affected some animation, and we've done it through JavaScript. Not so hard. Not so hard. Got that camera guy? One page of code. Uh, so I want to dive into the physics engine a little bit. Uh, so in this next example, I've created a particle with some uh, velocity and mass. And I've created a, a spring, which is part of the physics engine as well. And I've combined them all together in the scene graph. The really interesting uh, lines of code are here where I define a force, and I just simply apply it to the surface. So I'm doing that in the Z plane. So you can see what that does is when I click that surface, it behaves as a spring, right? Based on physics principles. So why is that more interesting than just simply adding a CSS3 transition? Well, there's a lot of reasons, one of which is they're infinitely composable, right? So if you basically build your whole scene into this vector field, you can have this thing happening at the same time as this thing happening at the same time as this thing. So you can stop animations in the middle. Instead of basically building your entire, uh, the entire space of what a could user could use out of a bunch of like uh, one dimensional transforms, uh, you're actually building a composed system where you can stop and uh, move it uh, like the very real time so that uh, 60 frames per second is not a problem at all. So I'm going to ditch that physics and the animation oh, for the on. time being. Okay. Really cool it is, as it is, but it's actually still there in the background, right? Because what I'm doing now is I've taken this scroll view component, and I've just thrown a bunch of surfaces, just as I was creating them previously. And here I am in a for loop, pushing those surfaces into an array. And then I sequence the scroll view from those surfaces. And what that's doing is it's building this scrollable list here. And it's a famous scroll view. And if you notice it bouncing at the end, that's famous doing the bouncing, right? So that's not the browser. So famous is actually has has uh, is able to do the same thing that iOS does, all in JavaScript and all rendering it uh, through the browser. Now you guys might say VFD um, for the kids, big big fancy deal, but uh, it was it's only been a few years since physics has actually entered the consciousness of the applications that we use. Something like the iOS app, the, you know, the iOS. Uh, the entire UI toolkit, uh, the kind of apps that we use, um, all the, a lot of that fluid, delicious motion is actually because they've introduced concepts like springs and very recently torque into, into the system. So in order to build something that feels like iOS, you'd want to use the principles uh, of iOS. And by the way, I'm not recommending you want to build an ersatz iOS application. You want to build something that makes people feel the same way they feel when they uh, build, feel a native application, and that is good. I think so. Well, I think that's really words. good when you do yes. that on the, on the web. Yeah. So who's heard of the leaderboard example app? Who's seen the leaderboard example app? For media, it's like one of the Hello World apps. Yeah. So we've taken. They graduated right right into like level two. Yeah, they could have seen They're the to-do's list app first. Yeah. That's pretty yeah pretty neat. Um, so anyway, we've taken that previous example. And rather than using, uh, and sorry, I should say that I've thrown the leaderboard code into this vanilla uh, Meteor project. But really, I've done very little else, nothing else. Uh, so rather than creating the surfaces in a for loop, now I'm using this cursor to array function to create the surfaces. And this is where uh, some of uh, that 
awesome power of Meteor comes into play. Because as you can see, I'm just using a find to return a cursor, and I'm mapping that to the surfaces array, and then just having this scroll view sequence over that, just like magic. And the cursor to array function is actually really, really basic, right? It just hooks into those event handlers that you get from an observe, and it modifies that array in place. And here's where you could introduce animations when data arrives down the, down the wire, or you could make room in your list uh, for, the, for the item that's coming up, or do any number of fancy things. So is this essentially the whole shim between the data flow aspects of Meteor and the visualization aspects of Meteor? Exactly, the exactly. The and it's, ha it's half shim, that. not quite yeah. the whole shim. We're getting okay. to the rest of the shim soon. <clears throat> now, in fact. So, <clears throat> In this step, I've done really not a whole lot more, except I've edited, added this header footer layout. And you can see down the bottom, we've got the footer. And I'm, rather, than, uh, rather than setting the content of a surface uh, just as a, as a string with HTML in it, what I'm going to do is complete the picture and render a Meteor template onto the, onto the face of that surface. And in fact, I'm doing the same thing up here too. So this is now, this is the same function that I was using previously to create these surfaces. But now I'm rendering the player template into the surfaces. And that's it. And I'm still using that same fundamental uh, code that powers the leaderboard example. So all the logic is still exactly the same and it's Meteor. And it's using the session and it's using uh, the collection uh, just as you would normally except it's using Famous now to draw the UI, to draw the scene. So you can use Famous for what it's good at, uh, which is all this fancy, crazy animation and physics. You're welcome. Thank you. I thought you might have something to add, <laughs> but you're silent. So I'm going to go over here now. And this is another one of the examples. You may have seen it. It's the wordplay example. And what I want to show you is when you've got uh, a complex Meteor app that you've already built and Famous comes out in 45 days and you're like, wow, I really want to use this in my app. So how much work is it going to be? So it turns out that it's not that much work and, and actually it's, it works really, really well. What you have to do though is you have to split your templates apart and put them on separate surfaces and then have Famous create that scene graph with the surfaces and then your templates will all talk to each other as normal through the session uh, and through the collections. So I've just added a little bit of pizzazz to the word play app, and that's all I've done. And you so can remember, see. yeah, like that surfaces are essentially what the GPU manages atomically. And another way to look at that is that which moves independently. So it's pretty obvious what the surfaces in this example are. And this is a pretty simple example, but it illustrates and can be applied directly to more complicated things like a Pinterest or a Facebook or a Yelp or a paper or whatever apps that you guys are thinking about building. Exactly. So really, the two very important pieces of this puzzle are using Observe to hook into your collections and doing something intelligent as they change. So creating surfaces in whatever way you want and applying animations and transforms there. And then using Meteor.render to, to render Meteor templates reactively uh, onto the surface, uh, onto your surfaces, rather than defining them uh, via code. And there's another app that I forgot to show you that I'll show you really quick. Oh, yeah, I did. And as soon as I saw this, this magic just like hooked together, I was wondering, like, is this, is this performant? Is this going to work fast, right? And so this is another very simple app that introduces some physics. <laughs> but watch this. This is really cool. And then I can tie it. But this is a fully functional Meteor app. And you can see. <laughs> as long as you time it right, you're uh, hitting stuff. You can see it's doing routing as well while the animations happen. So anything I, powerful mind enough to build something beautiful is powerful <laughs> enough to build something ridiculous as well. Exactly. So. <laughs> Uh, do we have time left? Yeah, we have one minute and 10 seconds left. Uh, I just want to make sure 
that you guys <laughs> took away what, we're, what our principles of famous are, because again, the meteor principles are so ingrained in you guys. Um, again, if you're building something uh, using JavaScript that's going to be uh, mind-blowing, inspiring, the kind of thing that you'd want to use, uh, you want to first of all treat your JavaScript like you're building an app, not like you're building a web document. You want to talk right to the GPU, and, uh, which is actually pretty simple to use, do with CSS if you do it right. And you want to use natural motion. Um, physics is probably the best way to, to do that. It's composable, it's configurable, and uh, it's actually pretty easy to use once you get the hang of it, instead of writing like you know, quadratic curves or something like that. Um, one other thing that I wanted to say while I have 27 seconds left, thank you for holding that up, <laughs> is uh, I wanted to show you one thing that we should be ready for. And you know, so right now we're talking about uh, building applications on the web using the constraints that we have, right? The constraints primarily of what the, do the, um, the document is going to do when you insert DOM into the system in the wrong way. Um, there we go. And this works on iOS just identically. Have you guys, have you guys seen the, uh, ever seen the, uh, what's this one called? The Rise application, the, the, probably like a, a new award winner from this year um, from the Apple Store. And this is, again, you can imagine what the surfaces are, what the transforms are, uh, and it works identically on iOS as it does on Android. And this is the kind of thing, again, that it's really hard to even do in Quartz Core. But in the background of this guy is WebGL. So WebGL is something, you know, you guys don't all know what GL is, but WebGL has recently been, been made available not only on browsers like Firefox, but also Google's Blink, and it will only be a matter of time this year before Apple does the same as well. So again, when we're talking next year about what it means to build a web application, we won't be talking about what we can do with, uh, physically, uh, with using physics on squares. We'll be talking about what it means to build something with not just dozens and hundreds of DOM elements, but millions of real vertices, shaders, and actual math. So that's gonna be a really exciting time. Okay, uh, okay. now it's time for Q&A. A stands for applause, by the way. <laughs> Yay! Thanks for having us, guys. Thank you. Yes, yes, sir, you're uh, in front. You talked about building a Pinterest layout, and uh, there's performance problems when you get into like infinite scroll and the number of DOM elements that increase over time. Right. Uh, does Famous just handle that issue for you, or is there some kind of, or do you have to worry about it yourself? Um, so the scroll views that we've built, I'm sorry, the question was, when, when dealing with this canonically hard problem, which is uh, scrolling, and something that's a, that is a problem not only in like fancy futuristic applications, but even in basic like list style applications, you know, how do you does does famous deal with scrolling for you, or do you have to deal with it yourself? Now, scrolling is one of the like really hard problems. Well, not not necessarily scrolling, but okay. the, the performance problems that come up when you get increasing number of uh, objects in the scene. Right. I think so, Famous does something uh, pretty smart about that, doesn't it? Right. So, so uh, if you put everything, if everything's visible, if you actually make like a million visible surfaces at once, you, you can overload the system just like you can overload anything else. But especially with something like scrolling, where we sort of know your behavior, we know that when this is on screen, this is not on screen, you do need to do active culling to make that work. Right, so when you get into Pinterest, which is a 2D layout, it's easy enough to do like scrolling in two dimensions where you're culling on both dimensions, but with an arbitrary layout that does get actually uh, more tricky because you want to lay things out in this like isotope style pattern. So yeah, Famous has the, there are the principles in Famous to handle that, and we're building the kind of templates and layouts that allow that to be not an issue for you. Because you don't want to deal with that, right? You want to build your app. You don't want to like solve fundamental problems in like surface management yourself. We should do that. Yes, sir. Uh, could you apply famous to a, say, a tessellated uh, pane and maybe apply a physics based vertex shader to uh, show physics at a smaller quantum? Or is that maybe in the future? Uh, so the question was could we, uh, sounds like two questions, right? One is can we apply famous to a tessellated pane? And I assume if the tessellation is non-rectilinear, then we're looking at something like using GL or Canvas to do that. And in principle, yes, we can. And the, cam and the, the GL is something that's coming out a little later than our initial DOM-based implementation. But sure, like the, G the GPU only thinks in terms of surfaces, and you know, GL communicates that to, to the GPU in its own way. Uh, when it comes to adjusting the, the quantum, the like delta T of physics, yes, that is also possible. We have our physics engineer in the back there, slunk down on the, on the couch. Um, it's all a matter of changing the delta T in the integrator that you're using to solve the, solve the equations that run the system. 
I'm glad you're here to field questions like that, Dave. And you can, you can make it negative. You can, run the, you can run the universe backwards. It's really neat. Yeah. Was that your question? I, by quantum, I just meant a high resolution on the, on the uh, but yeah, that, that, that answers it. Right. I mean, I guess the, the question is, uh, can you achieve higher resolution uh, of, of physics? Right, so we, we can do, the, the, the goal for any of these applications is 60 frames per second, or an update every 16.66 milliseconds. Any more than that, and you tend to get rate limited by the browser, because humans can't really see at any, you know, the, the, their internal clock doesn't work any faster than that. Right. Really what I'm getting at is, could we see these panes bend like paper? Oh, could you see panes bend like, so, paper, so these things expand in a rectilinear way, you can skew them, you can rotate them, but in terms of a, curvi a, curve, a curved bend, you need something like uh, Canvas or GL to accommodate that. And much like Meteor doesn't care what it renders to, Famous is architected in such a way that any of the back ends to which it would render um, are abstracted away. So soon, not yet. Our physics engineer, Dave Volbin's in the back if you'd like to talk to him more and get a real answer. And uh, we have the ability to ask more questions afterwards. All right, great, thanks guys. Thank you. Good job, Zoltan. Boom.